Thank you, David. You provided me with an example of how to use plasticity in, re in real time, because uh, about 50% of the things uh, were already said, and uh, this means I'll leave more time for uh, the talk, and this is why you came here, not to hear me. Uh, so I'm honored and pleased to introduce the speaker for the 2024 annual Einstein Memorial Lecture, Professor Mary Claire King, American Cancer Society professor at the Departments of Genome Sciences and Medicine, University of Washington, Seattle. Professor King is the world leader in the study of human genetics, including the interaction of genetics and environmental influences in the emergence of pathologies, uh, such as breast and ovarian cancer, uh, inherited deafness, schizophrenia, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis. Lots of sores, as we say. Professor King is known for many outstanding achievements, but perhaps the most famous accomplishment, which I already heard a little bit about, is being the first to show that breast cancer can be inherited due to mutations in the gene she named BRCA, B-R-C-A, one. The acronym stands for Breast Cancer Type 1 Susceptibility Protein. BR is the breast, and CA is the cancer, and one is the type 1. Her findings have had an immense impact on global health, including on millions of women who can now be screened for increased susceptibility to breast and ovarian cancer, and together with their physicians and families, make informed decisions to manage the risk. Professor King received her undergraduate degree in mathematics. No one is perfect. Cum laude from the Carleton College in Minnesota in 1967, and then joined the graduate program at the University of California at Berkeley, where she was also highly active in protests against the US involvement in Vietnam. Uh, it's recorded here. Uh, she temporarily dropped out of Berkeley after the National Guard was sent in against student protesters. Not personally after you, I assume, but in general. Uh, after the ret her return, her advisor, Professor Alan Wilson, a pioneer in the use of molecular approaches to understand human evolution, persuaded her, her to switch from mathematics to genetics. Unfortunately, Professor Wilson is not with us anymore, but I wanted to thank him for making this uh, great step for science. I don't know, maybe mathematics should help. No, no, no. <laughs> Her PhD thesis at Berkeley revolutionized evolutionary biology by uh, indeed demonstrating that uh, chimpanzees and humans differ only in 1% in the genome, and I also wanted to make a political point here, but I'm not going to make it. <laughs> After receiving a PhD from Berkeley in 73, King traveled to Santiago, Chile, to teach at the University of Chile as part of the University of California, University of Chile exchange program. Her time there was cut short when the government of Salvador Allende was overthrown by a CIA-backed military coup in September 73. King returned to Berkeley in late December of that year. She later learned that several of her colleagues and students had been killed or disappeared. She then continued her postdoctoral training at the University of California, San Francisco, UCSF, where she began studying why breast cancer tends to appear in families. In 1995, she moved to the University of Washington, Seattle. King's team carried out years of painstaking research, seeking a genetic marker uh, associated with breast cancer in families. During much of that time, the major idea was that this is caused by viruses, as far as I know. Uh, in 1990, King's team found that a single gene on chromosome 17 could be linked to breast and ovarian cancers, and shortly afterwards, they named the gene BRCA1. A second gene, BRCA2, was later identified. And indeed, uh, a major study was done in New York, the New York Breast Cancer Study, which definitely determined that uh, breast and ovarian cancer incidence, incidence was linked to inherited mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2. They studied women of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry in New York. And uh, when I saw the numbers, I thought of, uh, I'm not, 
you'll tell me whether I'm true. A group known for high incidence of breast cancer, up to 80% risk by the age 70. Wow. Compared with 12% in general population, I knew it's a huge difference, but not such much. She studied breast cancer incidence in genetics in other and genetics in other populations, including Palestinians and Nigerian women. Over the years, King has collaborated with scientists worldwide. One such collaboration is Professor Frat Levilad, is here, a, from Sharei Tzedek, a medical center in Jerusalem in studies of cancer genetics. Another notable collaboration, there are many others, a, focuses on the identification of genetic causes of hearing loss and deafness. And this, is, in, this includes Professor Karin Navarham, I think Karin... They are on the way, so we'll wait for her. <laughs> and uh, Tel Aviv University and Moyen Kanan at Bethlehem University in the West Bank. Heredity deafness is common among certain Palestinian and Israeli communities. And her collaborations emphasize that scientific work can and should transcend political divides. Uh, for outstanding scientific achievements, Professor King has achieved numerous awards and accolades. You heard about some. Uh, the Dan David Prize in Israel, the Mendel Medal of the Genetic Society in, Lon in, in London, uh, the Benjamin Franklin Medal of American Philosophical Society, and the Canada Gardner International Award. The method she has developed and perfected with her dedication to applying science to real-world problems beyond the bench and the seminar room have led her to become involved in forensic determination of individual identity, and David alluded to that. The first applied her expertise in human rights in 1984, when she and her lab began working with the grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, in Argentina, to identify missing persons, reunite children born to imprisoned women, political dissidents who later disappeared during the military dirty war from 1976 to 1983. This work will be discussed in this talk. King has collaborated with numerous human rights organizations, including Physicians for Human Rights and Amnesty International in various countries. Her lab has also provided DNA identification services for the US Army, the United Nations, and the United Nations War Crimes Tribunal. I'm pleased to invite Professor King to deliver the annual Einstein Memorial Lecture entitled Human Genetics and Human Rights, Developing DNA Familian met, uh, Methods to Search for the Disappeared Grandchildren in Argentina. Professor King. Thank you very much. It's, of course, an enormous pleasure to be here today. Um, it's, it's particularly moving to me to have my former postdoc, Avram Shag, who is doing the work that carries on the tradition I'm going to tell you about now um, on behalf of your country. When invited before October 7th, a year before, to give this talk, um, I thought it, it's a fable for our times. After October 7th, when the talk was postponed, I wondered if I should give it. Would it be too painful to hear? And I decided that I should for two reasons. One is that we're all citizens of the world, and we take those responsibilities very seriously, nowhere more than here. But there are occasionally times when what we know technically is a perfect fit for what needs to be done. And I think that this story illustrates one of those times, and certainly Evram Shag's service illustrates it again. And the other reason is to tell you that you are not alone, that what happened here on October 7th has happened before, and the ways that the country is coping with it, of course, is unique to, to every culture, but it has happened before. We will all get through this, and it's my pleasure to be able to tell you this story. So this is the story of human genetics and human rights, the search for the disappeared grandchildren of Argentina, and how one Shiksa Gringa came to be involved in it. Um, it. Because I suspect on YouTube, there are some young people who won't know why on earth I would be talking about this. I'm going to need to give you just a couple of minutes of historic context. 
Argentina during World War II was neutral. Uh, the president of Argentina was Juan Perón, a populist, and an extremely uh, well-regarded populist by his people who carried out many social reforms, but was also personally very much aligned with the Nazi and fascist regimes. And after World War II, he invited to Argentina the, the, the Nazis from Germany, the fascists from Italy, and they moved to, to Argentina, and their sons became the officers of the, of the military establishment in Argentina. Argent, so that was the 19... Late 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. During the late 1960s and 1970s, um, it's fair to say that violent conflicts erupted between individual groups on the far left and right wing death squads. And it was, it, it was horrible. It was contained, but it was horrible. Uh, when Perón died in 1974, his wife, Isabel Perón, not Eva, who had died many years earlier, Isabel Perón, who had no political experience and was, and was not, the, it was, was not the, the angelic figure that Eva had been, uh, became president. And the military took advantage of her weakness in 1976 to engineer a military coup d'etat, a golpe de estado. And they set about very systematically eliminating their opposition. And this slide to me illustrates that, that principle better than any other single image. This is the so-called tree of subversion that was part of the training manual for military officers in 1976 and following. And on the tree of subversion, we can see branches that you would expect the military to have considered their enemies, the Montaneros, the Arab, these are the left wing, um, the left wing activists and, and sometimes very violent activist um, groups. But you also see there are, um, there is indirect aggression, which consists of professors, nutritionists, statisticians, librarians, um, uh, liberal, uh, what is it, uh, liberal democracy, uh, of course, all the socialist parties, and the roots of the tree of subversion are Marxism, Freemasonry, and Zionism. So the military set out to pull up this tree by its roots and to destroy its roots, and they were very effective in doing so. So about a year after the military began to pick up people on the streets or in schools or at home, and people began to disappear, and, and as this was happening, of course, obviously there was not social media, as this was happening, people knew exactly what had happened in their own immediate neighborhood, but, they, but I don't think anyone in the civilian population had a sense of how widespread the repression was because they only knew what they saw. They only knew what was happening to their family or to someone in, in where they could hear the gunshots. So the people who began to hear the most were grandmothers. They were grandmothers of children who had disappeared under circumstances that were unusual, even in a set of unusual circumstances. So from 76 through 77 through 78, bodies, corpses, began to appear on the streets of Argentina, began to be washed up on the beaches where, where people had been thrown out of airplanes and had died. And yet when prelingual children were kidnapped along with their young parents, their bodies, with very few exceptions, did not appear. These prelingual children, these infants, simply disappeared. Similarly, there were young women who were pregnant when they were kidnapped and were kept alive until they gave birth. The babies were taken, and the young mothers were shot. The, the grandmothers of these babies learned of that in a number of ways. One way was that when a young pregnant woman was about to deliver, it was a practice of the militaries to kidnap a midwife or nurse off the streets, blindfold her, take her to the detention center where they were holding the young mother. And the detention centers ranged from conventional military bases to a Mercedes-Benz dealership in downtown Buenos Aires. I mean, they, they seconded to their use of a wide variety of places that had been civilian places. And to tell this nurse or midwife that she was to deliver the child of this, of this patient and she was not to speak to the woman. Well, of course they spoke. 
And in the course of the delivery, the nurse or the midwife was able to find out who the young woman was, who her mother was, and of course knew the sex and, and, and day of birth of the child. And in the vast majority of cases, the children were delivered healthy well, and the mothers were killed. The, the midwives and nurses then reported this information one by one at first to the mothers of these young women, and then the mothers learned about, the grandmothers learned about each other. And they formed in 1907 a, group, 1977, a group called the Grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo. The Plaza de Mayo is the square outside the government buildings in, in downtown Buenos Aires. And these grandmothers marched every Thursday morning, as you see here, wearing white scarves, it says, and bring them home. And the banner says, uh, liberty to all political prisoners, front for human rights. At least one midwife was herself picked up and murdered for having conveyed this information. As the years went on and the situation got worse and worse, the, the grandmothers learned of young children who were being presented to kindergartens and like anywhere else, when you start kindergarten, you have to have a birth certificate. And the birth certificates being presented for these, for these now five, five six-year-old children were clearly falsified. They, rather than being, they, they, they indicated that the child had been born at home, very unusual there as, as here. Um, they were signed by a physician who was not an obstetrician, but a military physician. And when the registrars at kindergarten scattered around the country would see these birth certificates, they would accept them, they would welcome the, the child into the class, and they would quietly report to the grandmothers. So the grandmothers learned more and more and more and more, and they filled black binders with just with data, just with information about children that they suspected were amongst this cohort of kidnapped infants, kidnapped because as, as infants or born into captivity. What were the numbers? How many people? We think that in total, between 450 and 500. But hold that thought. Um, in, in 1982, the military was in sorry shape. It was very unpopular. And they launched what they felt would be um, a way of recouping their popularity. That is, they invaded the Falkland Islands. The Falkland Islands, for those who do not know, are a set of islands close to Argentina. They have been disputed. The ownership is, of the Falklands has been disputed since the early 19th century, or perhaps earlier, or actually definitely earlier, since the middle of the 18th century, between Britain and Argentina, because the proximity to Argentina is quite obvious. In Argentina, they're known as the Malvinas Islands. In Britain, they're known as the Falklands. The people who live on the islands are overwhelmingly British. Um, but of course, their proximity is to Argentina. So it's always been a sore point. It was not, dare I say, the major source of, of uh, conversation in 1982 in, in Argentina. But the, the militaries la launched an invasion of the Falklands, um, perhaps to distract attention from the problems that they were having in Argentina proper. Uh, the British, of course, resisted this. The, the entire uh, undeclared war lasted 10 weeks. 649 young Argentinians were killed. They were completely unprepared for being in a, such a cold place in uh, the Southern Hemisphere winter. 256 British were killed and three Falkland Islanders were killed. And the British retook the Falklands, even though they had to do so from 8,000 miles away. It also parenthetically, uh, solidified the hold by Margaret Thatcher on her government for a very long period of time. So we have now the end of 1982, beginning of 1983, and the military is forced to withdraw. And in 1983, as they withdrew, there was an election held, and Raoul Alfonsin, a, a human rights lawyer, was elected president. He established a commission on the disappearance of persons led by Nobelist, literature Nobelist Ernesto Sabato, and Professor Sabado brought together people from all fields of Argentinian life to try to determine what had happened and what should be done next to try to bring the country back together. Part of this discussion was, of course, with that group of grandmothers who were marching around May Square every Thursday morning saying, bring them home. 
and uniquely among relatives of victims of the human rights abuses, they had circumstantial evidence, albeit anecdotal, that at that time they knew of 144 children that had been seen alive at least once after the parents were kidnapped. And they weren't sure who these children were. They had very good hypotheses about some. They had no hypotheses about others. So logically, they asked geneticists for help. And I received, with, with friends, this request for help in late 1983. And the request went like this. <laughs> they said, suppose we discover a child that we believe is among the kidnapped victims, that this child has a father who has disappeared and presumed dead, a mother who has disappeared and presumed dead, but let's suppose that all four of the grandparents are alive. Can you extend paternity testing, which of course is well known everywhere, to grand paternity testing? So at that time I was doing a really informal sabbatical in Luca Cavalli Sforza's lab at Stanford, and there were several people. There was a German, there was a, a French, there was an Italian, it was the usual crowd that goes into a lab at Stanford for fun. And so, and Luke is a very fine statist, uh, applied statistician. And so we all said, well, yes, we can. And so here's what, what we did. Uh, we developed a, a simple Bayesian algorithm. What's the probability of, the, of the, these grandparents being related to this child conditional on the genotype of the child? And we set it up simply as a, as a Bayesian likelihood ratio. Uh, with a priors, and we showed that you can have over a wide range of rationally uh, possible priors uh, determined by how much circumstantial evidence you have that, in fact, uh, you have got a, a child related to the grandparents, um, how to calculate a likelihood ratio. And we called this likelihood ratio the index of grand paternity. So the situation, <laughs> to put it in practical terms, is one has identified a child who may or may not be related to a family. And one has, hypothetically, um, a, a gene that has, let us say, is very informative, and it has two different forms, what we would call alleles, in each of the grandparents, so an ideal situation. So the paternal grandfather has alleles one and two, the paternal grandmother three and four, the maternal grandfather five and six, and the maternal grandmother seven and eight, the ideal situation. So then we genotype the child for the same gene, and suppose that the child has genotypes one and nine. Obviously, we can exclude the child from being related to this family. But of course, it's not enough to exclude, nor, may I say, it's not enough to exclude the child from being related to the people who are holding that child and claiming it is their biological child. We need to know who the child is, not only who the child is not. So. Suppose, in an ideal situation, we have this. We have, in this hypothetically very informative gene, uh, a, a situation in which the child has an allele number one and an allele number five. So clearly, this child could be the grandchild of these four grandparents, having inherited his allele number one from his paternal grandfather and his allele number five from his maternal grandfather. That's terrific, except if this is blood group O, you haven't learned very much. So everything, is de everything depends on how individually rare all of these alleles, all of these types of this gene are. Now, cast your mind back to 1984. What was the single most variable genomic region that we could access? in June of 1984. I know all of you think about this all the time, right? but I did, right? It was, it was the human leukocyte antigens. It was the HLA system, which was already being used to identify matching for organ transplants. And because Jean Dosset, based in Paris, had established a worldwide network of distributions of plates of antibodies, it was possible for laboratories anywhere to test antigens of patients, or to test blood of white cells of patients who needed organ transplants against those antibodies. And there was a beautiful standardized system that had existed since the mid-70s, to which in my lab in Berkeley was a small part, very small part, uh, that everyone in the consortium knew about. 
and would trade around and share information so that when a patient came in needing, let us say, a kidney transplant, a patient in, in Madrid could be matched with a willing donor in Buenos Aires. And this, it was working beautifully. And the HLA types are so variable because they are a major determinant of immune response. They go back very deeply in evolution, all the way back to vertebrate evolution. I mean, you see the same types in mice that you see in people. And, and there's been clearly very positive selection for tremendous heterogeneity in order to have the maximum possible efficiency of immune response. So HLA typing was a terrific idea for this kind of a problem. The, the challenge was that because the typing system required that one have fresh blood and, and type that fresh blood against this these panels of antibodies, this wasn't anything you could ship around. Nobody was typing using DNA yet. So uh, I thought to myself, how is this ever going to be possible for these women to organize this in Buenos Aires? But I needn't have waited long because as soon as we sent them these statistical results and I was mulling over how are they actually going to operationalize it, um, I got a call back and from Rosso Rosenblit, who became my teacher in all things in this project, and, and Rosso Rosenblit, who in her, in her life before uh, her, her uh, daughter was murdered and her, and her grandson was kidnapped, um, was an obstetrician. And so well-trained, she knew about all this system. And she said, you must come down to Buenos Aires and help us put this into effect. And recall what we've just heard. I, I had worked in Chile during the Unidad Popular government in the early 1970s. It's now 1984. My Spanish was more rusty than anyone would believe possible. But of course, I said yes. And I went to Buenos Aires in June of 1984 for what I anticipated would be a single trip of symbolic solidarity. And my most recent trip was in September of 2023, 40 years later, and the project continues. So watch out when you undertake what you think is going to be a single trip of solidarity. Um, so <laughs> I arrived in Buenos Aires in June of 84 with a number of other technical people that um, Professor Sabado's committee had asked to convene there. And these ranged from people in um, the American Army who were uh, forensic odontologists, uh, pathologists. It was, a, it was a very good technical group. All of the others had the, had the task of helping with exhumations and identifying remains using, I don't mean this in any derogatory way, but using conventional methods, methods that had been very well established and had been in place for, for decades, and these were the best guys on the planet at doing this. But the grandmothers, of course, had a very specific need, which is how to identify grandchildren in the situation that we see on this slide. So I presented what I just told you to an audience in a room somewhat bigger than this. It was absolutely full. There were relatives of disappeared people on one side of the hall. There were militaries in uniform on the other side of the hall, and the rows in the middle were pretty much empty. And at the end of that, um, Rosa said, we must go now to the office of the grandmothers. And we went back to downtown Buenos Aires, went up to the um, in a modest apartment building, Corrientes, went up, went in, the, went in the door, and there on the opposite wall were the photos that you see here. This is a poster made from the photos, and it says, we are searching for two generations. And as you see, there's hundreds and hundreds of photos of young adults who were kidnapped. Pardon me? Oh, I'm so sorry. There we go. Young adults who were kidnapped and grandchildren, the ones who were already alive at the time that they were kidnapped. So I said, oh my God, you know, at the time, I mean, the impact, the, the, the number of cases that they had for which they had enough information to put a picture on the wall, um, I had no idea it was so large. And, and Rosa said, we have 144 cases. And she showed me these black binders. And I said, Rosa, you remind me of Madame Defarge. And she said, who is Madame Defarge? In retrospect, she knew, but she wasn't, and it was out of context. And I, of course, explained who Madame Defarge was. And I said, this is a woman who knit the names of the, of the, I'll tell you. <laughs> In Tale of Two Cities, Madame Defarge is, is a peasant woman who knits into 
a long scarf, the names of the people on whom the peasants will take revenge when there is a revolution. And she knits and she knits and she knits and she knits. And Rosa listened to this explanation and she said, my dear, I don't have time to knit anymore. I use a personal computer. <laughs> so to me, I thought, right, this is a serious, this is a serious situation and, and this may work. So go back to the idea of where, how are the grandma is going to operationalize this. <laughs> they knew, because I was certainly not the only geneticist they were speaking with, they knew from speaking with Argentinian geneticists all in exile at this point, um, that there was one of these HLA typing laboratories in Buenos Aires, in the Durand Hospital, for the clinical raison d'etre of these laboratories. So off we went to the Durand Hospital, and in, in the middle of this very run, otherwise very run down hospital. There was a beautifully equipped lab with technicians working there doing extremely good typing. And the, 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 the capacity of Dr. Dose and his group to get funds into places all over the world to enable this whole organ transplant system to work worldwide was remarkable. And by this time he'd been at it almost a decade in the field. I mean, he, of course the work goes back to the 50s. So, I said, Rosa, this is fabulous, but the wall, with whom do we begin? And Rosa said, we're going to begin with Paula Logares. So I said, tell me about Paula. So here's a picture <coughs> of Paula when she was 22 months old at about the time, just a few weeks before she and her parents were kidnapped. Monica Greenspan and Ernesto Logares are her parents. Um, they had been radical leftists. They had left the leftist parties and then moved to Montevideo in order to pursue studies in law. So they were in Uruguay. Um, the Argentinian police came to Montevideo, picked up the whole family. Uh, neither of the parents have been seen again. We have not ever recovered their remains. And Paola completely disappeared. As time went on, the grandmothers had circumstantial evidence that a child who was being presented to, one, to kindergarten with one of these query phony birth certificates um, and was living in the household of a, a police officer named Yavayen might be Paula. The reason is, of course, Paula was 22 months old when she was kidnapped, so there were pictures. And the, the age fit, the child was even being called Paula. She was being called Paula Yavayen. And there were... Uh, the the ages the ages fit, so they the the grandmothers before I got there in June the grandmothers had obtained as soon as it was possible as soon as the military withdrew as soon as the Sabado Commission uh, began their work they had obtained a court order to to obtain a blood sample from Paula hypothetically Greenspan Logares nominally Yavayen so. We genotyped at, at the, at the uh, Durand Hospital the HLA types in type A and type B for Paula, for Paula. And we asked the question, could she be a child in this family? And as you see, she could be. So the way this pedigree is set up is Paula's types at the HLA A locus, the HLA A gene, are type A1 and type A2. And at the very, very, very close by, HLA-B gene is B5. In other words, she has two copies of B5. So her two haplotypes, her two shared bits, have to be from one of her parents, whoever those people are, A1-B5 and A2-B5. So hold that thought. And now look at the, at the Logatus grandparents. Both of them are alive. And it's consistent with A2B5 being from her paternal grandfather. On the Greenspan side of her family, her, or the uh, Senor Greenspan had died of natural causes after the kidnapping and murder of his daughter. But we could reconstruct his genotypes from his surviving sons, and undisputed surviving sons. And as you can see, based on that reconstruction, A1B5 is a possibility for Paula. A1B5 is, is a common haplotype in, in the populations that make up Argentina. So how did we know that? Because of this worldwide collaboration for organ transplants, uh, population frequencies of all of the AB 
combined types, AB haplotypes, had been worked out for populations worldwide. Uh, and Argentina, I knew, was about 40% Spanish, about 40% Italian, about 10% German, about 10% British. So I took both those known frequencies of these types and also ones that had been developed for Argentina itself, which meshed pretty nicely, and figured out what the frequencies were of A1B5 and A2B5. A1B5 is pretty common. A2B5 is really, really rare. So when we calculated the, the likelihood ratio, like I just told you, we ended up with a probability of relationship as opposed to the coincidental co-occurrence of these haplotypes in this child just as a random person from Argentina of more than 99.9% which for the time was astronomically high. We presented, <laughs> so we presented that information to court. Now, nobody had done this for grandparenting, grandparentage testing before, but more importantly, what do you do about the courts? When the militaries had, had come to power in Argentina, one of the first things they had done was to, beginning with the Argentinian Supreme Court, they had exiled, imprisoned, uh, or otherwise marginalized the Supreme Court justices, and they had put in their own people. They had worked their way down through the appellate court system, the superior court system. I'm, I'm using the American words. I, I don't know the Argentinian equivalent words. But the, the one court system they never thought to intervene on were the family courts. Big mistake. So. This is a custody situation. So the grandmothers and their solicitors went to the family courts, and they presented this data. And excuse me. And the and the the um, the judge of the family court said this is very convincing. We must often offer also to uh, the avians the opportunity to prove that they are the parents of this child. They completely negated that. They said they did not want to be tested. It was an invasion of their privacy. They would not be tested. So the judge said, given positive evidence, 99.9%, that this child is a member of the Greenspan and Logatis families, and the unwillingness of Yavayen and his wife to be tested, uh, I declare that this child should be returned to the Greenspan and Logatis families. Yavayen appealed. Um, to the appellate court. Now, when when democracy had returned to to Argentina, the first thing that President Alfonso, well, the first thing he did was set up the Commission on the Disappearance of Persons. The second thing he did was to start to bring back the people to their positions in the court system. So the Supreme Court was restored to its previous people, and he was working his way through the appellate courts. But it hadn't completely happened yet. So when Yavayan appealed, he appealed on the grounds that he stops claiming that the child was his child, that he had rescued this child from destruction, that he and his wife were the only family this child knew, and that to fail, that to take her away from them now would be devastating. She was now eight years old. Um, it was also became clear in the course of these weeks that he had been a guard at the detention center where um, Monica Greenspan and Ernesto Logadas had taken and from which had been taken and from which they had disappeared. So there was yet another very strong piece of circumstantial evidence that tied Paul to the whole story. So now we have, I mean, the child is now with, um, still with Yavayan, and the appellate court has reversed the, the ruling of the family court. So the grandmothers took the case to the Supreme Court of Argentina, and here is my effort to say in English what they argued. They made five arguments. <laughs> First, it is not reasonable to ask whether the kidnapper of a child who was involved in the torture and murder of her parents is an adequate parent for his victim, because Yavayan had claimed that he and his wife had treated Paula well. Second, a child should not remain in the hands of kidnappers, regardless of the age of the child when kidnapped. He claimed she knew no one but them. Third, kidnapping is universally considered a crime. Is the situation different in Argentina because it happened on a large scale? Fourth, 
To abandon the search for kidnapped children in Argentina is to abandon a group of children who will not grow up in carefree innocence. As these children grow up, they will suspect the truth. What will be the effect of learning that they have been raised by people involved in the murder of their parents, and indeed, that they had biological families who had not come looking for them? And fifth, adults everywhere have responsibility to children everywhere. Does failing to identify kidnapped children implicitly grant immunity to kidnappers? Does it give, give a sense of invulnerability to violators of human rights in other countries? Supreme Court took this under advisement and just before Christmas of 1984, ruled that Paula should be returned to the Glogaris and Greenspan families. Um, in December, December 25th, this article came out on the 26th um, of 1984, Paula went back to the, to the Logaris home, a simple, a simple home, walked up the sidewalk to a home, of course, she had not been in in six years. Her grandmother opened the door. Paula turned to the left, opened the door to the little room that she, where she used to sleep when she was a baby and we'd been converted in the meanwhile into a sewing room, looked at the, looked at the, at the, at the uh, couch and said, where is my teddy bear? Mm -hmm. And her teddy bear had been kidnapped with her and was not ever found. Here's a picture of Paula as a, a young teen working at the, oficina de la, at the office of the abuelas. And here's Paula when she and I met for the first time after she became an adult in 2023. She's absolutely fabulous person. Fabulous person. And she said that when she was first introduced to her grandmother, uh, she, was, she said she was very hostile, that she, that, it, that she just felt her world was, and she was correct, being turned upside down. And she said it took, it took months, but the, the love of her grandmother, whom I met, who's of course elderly now, um, and, and the care with which she was surrounded by this community, it worked, and it worked over time. And you could not imagine a more personally beautiful um, representative to be the first person by happenstance of this process. So, <laughs> flush with success in December 26th of 1984, um, I said to the grandmothers, oh, this is absolutely wonderful. And they said, when are you coming back? We have the next set of cases for you to work on. And this was the next set of cases that we worked on immediately. So I went back. This is the next set of cases on which we worked immediately because in each of these cases, the grandmothers had a hypothesis about who the child was. They had circumstantial evidence. We were not working only from genetics. And in each of these cases, the asterisks inside the symbols represent people for whom we had blood samples. And in all cases, the, the, um, the possible, the, the children who might be related to these families, the blood samples were obtained in consequence of, a court, of court orders, which became, as you might imagine, more and more difficult because the military and police who were, and their confederates who were holding these children were trying, I mean, they realized immediately what was going on and they were trying to block them. But these, for these people, for these families, or for these children, we had such orders and therefore we had, we had, um, we had blood samples and therefore we had white cells. I want to tell you a little bit about the Gatica Caracoche family, which at one level is simpler because as you see, the parents survived. So from the point of view of a geneticist, it's simpler, but from the point of view of what happened to the family, it's very complex. So this story is a story of a farm worker family, and Mr. and Mrs. Gatico were both farm workers, and the time the story begins in 1976, they had two children, Maria and Eugenia, the girl for whom the first question mark is, is placed, and Felipe, the boy for whom the second question mark is placed. And Maria and Eugenia, was off playing with a friend of hers um, and, and staying overnight at his house named Jose Sabino Abdallah. And the police came in and they picked up the whole Abdallah family, the mother, Jose Sabino, and in the sweep, Maria Eugenia also, and they disappeared. Felipe and, and Maria Eugenia was, I think, about five years old at the time. And Maria, uh, the second child, Felipe, was four months old at the time, and of course, uh, Mrs. Gatica coming home and seeing this chaos down the street asked all her neighbors what happened to my, you know, where's my daughter, what happened to the Abdallah family, and so on, and was told. And so carrying Felipe, she went to the local police station 
and demanded to know what had happened to her child and, of course, what had happened to the Abdallah family. The police responded by grabbing her. And, of course, she's holding her four-month-old baby. She saw a young teenager, whom she didn't know, walking along the road, and she took the baby and she tossed the baby to the teenage girl. And the teenage girl didn't know her, but she saw the situation, she grabbed the baby and she ran. And she ran to the person that she trusted most in this poor neighborhood, and that person was, it won't surprise you to learn, the nurse, the nurse of the area. So she brought the baby to the nurse, she explained what she'd just seen, And of course, the nurse had no idea who the baby was either, but she also understood the situation perfectly. And she said, I'm not going to be able to hide the baby for long because, of course, I, as the nurse of the whole area, um, am also under surveillance, but I will find a place to put him. So it took her about, I think, about six weeks. I've heard a couple of versions of this, but somewhere between two and six weeks to find a family of professional people, lawyers, who had children of their own, people of complete confidence, and she took the baby to them and told them what she knew, which is what I've just told you, and they said, we will keep him until his parents either come or do not. And they decided to not tell him, I mean, he's four months old, so he's going to grow up with their children, to not tell him the circumstances under which he came to them because they didn't know what the ultimate denouement of this would be. So they cared for him and kept him in, a, in an informal situation. So what happened? Uh, the, the, the Gatica Caracoche couple, Mr. and Mrs. Gatica, were essentially uniquely released. And they were released because the United Farm Workers raised holy hell. And they let the couple go. They were Brazilian by, by original um, ancestry. They went back to Brazil. They found each other. They'd been kept separately. Went back to Brazil, found each other, and had two more children who are indicated on the pedigree as not ever having been in jeopardy. And they've and then they spent the next seven years trying to find their two older children. They found um, they found first indication that there was a girl living with a, a a fam- a family's not quite the right word, a couple um, who had since become quite well off. And the, the man in this couple was a commissioner of police in one of the outlying uh, towns outside of Buenos Aires. And everything fit for her being, um, the, pos- the possibility of her being Maria Eugenia. Uh, she had been at the same place where, uh, where the... Uh, where the Abdallah family had been had been taken. He had been responsible for that area at the time. So it was very good circumstantial evidence that she might be that, that child. Um, they got a court order to get a blood sample for her, whereupon her, what I'm going to call her imposed father, took her away again. He basically re-kidnapped her and took her out of that area. The, the governor, the now civilian governor, of Buenos Aires province got on the radio and said, bring that child home. The the dictatorship is over. We will not protect you. You may be the commissioner of of this town, commissioner of police of this town, but you are not under the protection of the law if you are suspected of kidnapping a child. Come back and deal with this in a court. And he did. He did. Um, So a blood sample was obtained from Maria Eugenia. And so where's Felipe? The the grandmothers and the Gaticas basically worked their way backwards. And they found the nurse who had rescued Felipe. And when and when talking to them, I, I was I was there and, and and she said she said, when I held that baby in my arms, I felt like Pharaoh's daughter rescuing Moses from the bulrushes. And she said, I have to find a safe place. And she said, I just thought. This has happened before. I can do this. And of course, she had done it. So she, t- she did not want to tell them at first who was holding Felipe, who had cared for him, because this was shortly after the end of the militaries, and she was not at all sure that this wasn't all going to come crashing down again. And it took, and, and the grandmothers talked with her, the Gaticas talked with her, and she said, 
I'm going to talk with, with the family that are holding him, and then I'll get back to you. And she did. And about three weeks later, um, the family said, we have told Felipe who he is. We've told him the entire story. Please come and meet him. And so the, the, the Gaticas and their two younger children, Maria Eugenia, all went to see Felipe, and that's what happened. And we did the genetics, but you didn't need a weatherman. I mean, this was, <laughs> this was pretty clear. Um, the, the couple, the human rights lawyers, who had cared for Felipe for those seven years became the godparents to all four of these children and sustained their education and have been ever since. Um, I mean, they have recently died, but were, were very important in the lives of these children. And here's a pic from a number of years ago of Maria Eugenia and Felipe in, as teenagers in Brazil. I want to show you a couple of other cases to make, <coughs> to make a series of different points. Um, these are two sisters, Laura Jotar Britos and Titania Rarte Britos. And I make this point, I show this picture to make the point that some children were, in addition to Felipe Catica, some children were kept by families who had no idea that they were, that they were kidnapped children. In this case, the, the way the story unraveled was that um, Senoras Filigoy uh, from Buenos Aires was outside walking after the ends of the militaries. No, sorry, before, just before the ends of the militaries, in 82, um, in the Plaza de Mayo, and she saw the grandmothers marching with these posters that says, bring them home, um, with a picture of Titania, the older of these children, on it, Titania, of course, as an infant. And Mrs. Filigoy fearlessly, I mean, the militaries were surrounding the grandmothers as they walked, walked across these gun-toting guys up to this grandmother and said, I think I have your granddaughter, and if it's the same child, she has a sister. And so they all began to discuss this, and it turned out that Upon the murder of, of the mother of, these, of the one child who was already born and the, uh, the second child who was born in captivity, um, the, the Siligoy family, professional people, had been offered by a judge two sisters whom he said had been abandoned on the street. And the, the, the Siligoy thought this was very unlikely because this is very unlikely to happen almost, it was unheard of. But they, I mean, like everyone else, they knew what was happening in their neighborhood. They didn't know what was happening globally in, in the city or this country. So they accepted the children and they began to raise them. And, and when uh, the civil guys took them home, shortly after, the, the, the older child wouldn't speak at all. She just completely mute. And she was out walking with her mother at the first week or so that she was with them. She was three and a half. And she saw a Gray Ford Falcon coming down the street, and she started screaming. Well, Gray Ford Falcons were the way that the military, when the military would grab one of their victims, they would shove them into the, into a Ford Falcon. These were their, their you know, unmarked cars. And she started screaming and screaming, and Mrs. Siligoy began to put two and two together at that point. And she raised the girls, and with the realization of who these children were, we did the kind of typing that I've been telling you about, I won't go through it, uh, the, de the decision was made by the families that the girls, and as you see, they're, they're a bit older when it, this all got, got sorted, that the girls would remain with the Svildogoys, who had indeed the means to care for them, that they would um, they would take back their own names, and they would have bat mitzvahs under their own names. And now they, they have cousins whom they see who are their biological cousins. They know their history, but they continue to live with the Sivagoys. And now, of course, they're, they're adult women. I show you this case because it's a very sad case, but it shows the power of what we were doing, even under sad circumstances. Maria Cristina Lopez Guerra, Martin Belaustigui, married couple, um, both from professional families. Um, uh, Maria Cristina was pregnant when she was when she was ab abducted by the by the militaries, and she would have given birth. She was eight months pregnant. She would have given birth shortly thereafter. 
Um, she and Martine both disappeared and we have not recovered their remains. A possible child of the correct age was identified and the grandmothers had every hope that it would be the grandchild in this family. It was not. Um, we have not identified who that child is, nor have we identified who their grandchild or who their child is. I mean, not, not every case is solved, not close. Well, maybe close, but not every case is solved. This family <laughs> taught us something very important. This is the Lavalle Lemos family. And in this case, the, um, the military came into the, to the, to a town, a working class um, town near Buenos Aires and kidnapped the mother and father, Gustavo and Monica, and their then infant daughter, Maria. They returned Maria, rather than keeping her, they returned Maria to Haide Lemos, her maternal grandmother. They did so essentially immediately. Monica and Gustavo have disappeared and not ever been found, but Monica was eight months pregnant when she was kidnapped. So we learned from a woman who had been her cellmate that she had survived until she gave birth and that she was then killed and that the baby had been taken. And we knew that she wanted to name the baby Maria Jose. And we learned that for a very particular reason. Um, the World Cup was held in Buenos Aires in, I think, 1978. I think I have that right. And the, the athletes of the World Cup said, we will not play in Buenos Aires as long as you hold these thousands of political prisoners. And the military, in response, the military and police in their various detention centers, went around saying, you're released, you're released, you're released. And they, they released several hundred people who reported back to the human rights community who they knew. And that's how we knew that Monica Lemos had lived long enough to give birth. So time goes on, and at the at ten years later, word word comes through from rumors and and in this case, in this particular case, a woman who had been a housekeeper in the home of the woman who had been the guard for pregnant prisoners at one of these detention centers, that the that 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 guard had taken one of these babies for herself. And the age pretty much matched what we would expect for Maria Jose Lavalle uh, Lemos based on what we knew from this witness who had been released at the time of the 78 World Cup. So we did our HLA testing. And bear in mind, we have here only one grandparent still living, but we have an undisputed granddaughter of that grandparent named Maria. It's a little confusing because we're Maria and Maria Jose, but Maria, born in 1976, and Heidi are undisputed grandmother granddaughter. And by incredible good luck, they, the two of them and Maria Jose shared a very rare HLA haplotype. So this was fantastic, but I thought, you know, this is just sheer luck. I mean, the, the, perfectly possible that there would have been no sharing with Heidi at all at that one genetic region. And even if there had been, that it, might have, that it would have been something common. But it wasn't. We lucked out. So I was concerned about this, to put it mildly. And the grandmother said, Nina, go back to Berkeley, figure, figure it out, give us a call in a couple of weeks when you've got it solved. So I went back to Berkeley. And I went to see my advisor, my former advisor, Alan Wilson, who had had beginning in the early 1980s, I was a student in the late, in the early 1970s, had, late 60s, early 70s, had been working on um, the question of human origins and human relationships amongst human, humans of different ancestries using mitochondrial DNA. And the way he had done this was to work with placentas. My daughter's placenta is one of them. Work with placentas of you know young women, friends of the lab, from all over the world, who would donate their placentas, and he would isolate DNA from it. And then the lab folks would isolate mitochondrial DNA from that. 
there is about 15 times as much, or at least 15 times as much mitochondrial DNA per cell as there is nuclear DNA per cell. So it's the best place to be able to isolate DNA. And highly relevantly, that region at the very top of this drawing of the, of the mitochondrial DNA loop, which is 16,000 base pairs, it's called the D loop on this drawing, is the origin of replication of mitochondrial DNA, which does not encode any genes, so it's not been subject to selection, so it accrues changes only by mutation. So thing number one, advantage number one of mitochondrial DNA for Alan and for us, uh, is that we have a region of a relatively abundant molecule that is highly, highly variable. Second thing is that mitochondrial DNA does not live in the nucleus of cells. It lives in the cytoplasm, in the mitochondria. Therefore, mitochondrial DNA is transmitted only maternally in humans, as shown on this complex pedigree, where everybody in red shares the same mitochondrial DNA sequence, whether they're male or female, but if they inherited their mitochondrion shared with a shared mother, they have the same mitochondrial sequence. Everybody in green has the same mitochondrial sequence. Everybody in blue has the same mitochondrial sequence as each other. So this means, in principle, that the, that the grandchild in question in this hypothetical pedigree can be that the sequence of that child can be represented by any of the red sequences on this pedigree. But what are we going to do about the fact that we don't have placentas of these people? We don't have enough DNA to be able to sequence. And Alan was sequencing one base pair at a time. He and Becky Kahn in the lab were sequencing one base pair at a time, literally reading off to each other, A, T, G, C, uh, mitochondrial sequences. Well, that same, that same summer, who should be working on a very nice project, but Carrie Mullis, who was a member of the same department and my friend when we were all graduate students, um, who worked out PCR. So this all converges in the same three-week period. And PCR, of course, enables one to take one segment of DNA, which one identifies by a pair of flanking base pair, a pair of, of, of flanking short sequences, amplify across it, and make an infinite number of copies of that little sequence in between. So the easiest thing for the Wilson lab to do was to put flanking base pairs oops, at the opposite ends of this origin of replication region and amplify across and then read off those sequences. Now, they were concerned about this from the point of view of looking at human origins. I was concerned about this from the point of view of figuring out who the red people were. So we, all, we were all on the same page about this. And I said, the first case I want to try, I want to try this with blood from um, Heidi Lemos and her putative granddaughter, the one with whom she shares this, well, both of them, but the, the one who had been kidnapped with whom she shares this extremely rare haplotype. And here's the story. They match perfectly all the way across these several hundred base pairs of this origin of replication region. Now, how did I know this wasn't the universal sequence? Well, Alan, of course, had been at this now for a couple of years with the placentas, and so he had hundreds of different sequences of this exact region written out you know, with a typewriter just like this, and I could compare the sequences of Maria Jose and Heidi, which of course are identical to each other, to everything the Wilson lab had, and it was different than whatever else was in the Wilson lab. So I indeed did call the grandmothers in a couple of weeks and say, I think we've got it, and this is the way that it, it can work. And here is Heidi and her two, and her two granddaughters, and I met them in, uh, in September of 2023 also. Now, this, of course, raised a very important question. Um, we were now going to have the possibility of making identifications of a much larger number of families because we no longer needed to have all four grandparents living or, or reconstructable in order to have complete, complete relevant information for the families. It also opened the possibility that we would be able to make hypotheses based on DNA, mitochondrial DNA sequencing itself, which sometimes by itself, if, if it was a sufficiently rare sequence, 
or sometimes combined with circumstantial evidence, would lead us to who a child was, to a direct case of identity. So for that, we needed a logical place, rationally housed in Buenos Aires with professional people who would keep track of all this information and who would keep a rigorous chain of custody that would be suitable for presenting to courts. And uh, President Alfonsin, of course, understood this as well as anybody because he was himself a lawyer. So um, he and his administration presented in 1987 to the Argentinian Congress Law uh, 23511, which was the establishment of a national genetic data bank, which still exists in perfectly reasonable laboratory in Buenos Aires, that does exactly the kind of thing we've been talking about. It keeps complete records of, of every family, of everyone who comes in who thinks they might be part of, of the kidnapped cohort, of of grandparents now long deceased who are looking for children. When we first began this in 87, I mean, this is not very far after the ends of the militaries, we had duplicates of everything that they had there in my lab in Berkeley. And Dr. Dosse also said, if you need to put another set of DNA here in Paris, you know, feel free. I'll be happy to be a third, a third resource. I, I turned it out, turned out I needed him much more to counteract misinformation that was being disseminated all about around Argentina about how I, this crazy leftist feminist, was in cahoots with the with the um, with the grandmothers. The the National Genetic Data Bank is completely independent of the grandmothers. It's a national genetic data bank, and they are clients of it. <laughs> so, once that was established, as you might imagine, we were immediately asked, could we identify remains of deceased individuals from the same period? by matching mitochondrial DNA sequences to their maternal relatives. So I said, I think perhaps we can do this. The question will be, what will be the best source of DNA from the remains? Now, at that time, we, we knew that we had the skull of Liliana Pareja present among us. And we knew that because at the trial of the generals in 1985, Clyde Snow, who's a, a forensic anthropologist, had identified the skull of Liliana based on her dental records and, and had described how she had been murdered by a bullet to the skull. And that had been a major portion of the, te of the testimony in the trial of the generals. Um, with the permission, indeed, at the, at the encouragement of her parents, we took a tooth from the skull and we treated that tooth like a diamond. It was an intact tooth, so that meant the pulp was intact. And, excuse me, we put it in a sterile hood, and we cleaved it like a diamond with a sterile cleaver. And we took the pulp, and we extracted the DNA from the pulp, and compared it, sequenced the mitochondrial region, and compared it to DNA from the blood of Liliana's mother. And this was back in the days when we did this one base pair at a time, and here are those sequences. So I thought, good. Now, Liliana's identity was not in doubt. She was our, our positive test case. But we needed to get this into the literature as an approach so that we could use it in the courts in Argentina and indeed in courts, potentially in courts elsewhere. So we set up a little scheme and went back to Berkeley again, <laughs> and we asked the mothers of all the people in my lab and all my friends uh, if we could have their, their children's baby teeth. So we collected baby teeth, and then we collected blood from the same people, and then we collected blood from their mothers, and we made this little table. And the first uh, families, one, two, three, four, and five, are of that sort that I just told you. Everybody is alive and well, and we're, what we're looking at are the regions in that mitochondrial sequence around that origin of replication regions that are variable. Not all the base pairs are variable. And the labels 16126, for example, that's the nomenclature um, number of that base pair in the entire mitochondrial D loop. The last case on this table is interesting for, for, for another reason. Um, in the midst of all this, <laughs> in fact, what made me realize that we had to get this uh, into the peer-reviewed literature, uh, one of those one of those forensics with whom I had worked back in '84, and we're now and we're now later, um, asked if I could help the New York State Police 
with the identification of remains of a boy, a young boy, whose remains have been found in upstate New York. And um, it was um, Lowell Jensen's hypothesis that this boy, he worked with them also, that this boy might be a murder victim from a number of years before, right age, so on. And so we took um, the two molars from those remains and blood from the mother of the hypothetical mother of the, of the remains, and we sequenced. And what you see here is they match each other, but it's radically different sequence. And the reason is that this child is African ancestry. And that made me realize how much power there is in African ancestry, both, I mean, for any project, but this approach was going to be extremely powerful in Africa because African ancestries are much, much, much more variable than all of us out of Africa types. And the reason is, parentheses, that, so we in chimpanzees, as you have heard, are very closely related. We diverged five, six million years ago. And people only started to leave Africa about 100,000 years ago, and only small numbers of people left. So that means that 99% of human evolution took place in Africa before people left, and all of that evolutionary um, beauty is still there with only a few you know, small, relatively small numbers of people leaving, and of course then all populations increasing um, at, at at rapid rates and much, much more variation appearing. But there's a whole tranche of variation that exists in Africa that does not exist out of Africa, except, of course, in the African diaspora. So this was evidence of it right off the bat, but I kept in mind the fact that this approach would be useful in Africa in the hands of people who were in a position to do this kind of comparison, teeth from remains versus blood from people who are looking for their for their missing relatives. Meanwhile, back in Argentina, the first case that we were asked to work on was the case of the Manfield family. And that case goes like this. Uh, Caldos and Angelica had four children. And at the time in 1976, when soldiers burst into their apartment in, um, in a working class town near, near Buenos Aires, they Graciela, who was at the time 12 years old, was at a sleepover with a friend. Carlos Carlitos was, was there, and he heard the, he heard the, the racket um, outside on the sidewalk and stuck his head out of the window. It was night, put his head out of the window, and was shot. And as he fell, he fell on top of his sister Karina. And when the militaries came bursting in, they thought that both children were dead. He was. She wasn't. Christian was a baby, and he was left untouched. The parents were taken, and we've never seen, we've never seen them again. So Karina grew up. Oh, well, so Ana Ocampo, the paternal grandmother, came the next day, having heard about this horrible event, found the three surviving or found the two surviving children in the apartment, found the body of, of Carlitos. No, I'm sorry, no body. She found the, the two surviving children in the apartment. She had Graciela with her, and she, of course, took all the children and cared for them. Karina grew up and joined a group of young people that, that are remarkable people. They are the Argentine forensic anthropology team that we established when we were beginning to work with remains in Argentina, and they were doing exhumations very carefully. They have since become the United Nations forensic anthropology team. They are now, of course, um, very senior forensics in the world, and Karina is one of them. And one project that, of course, she wanted to resolve was what happened to her family. So, in um, the, the town of Avenida, I'm not going to pronouncing it, Avenida, uh, there was a mass grave, which is shown in a sketch by the forensic anthropology team in the upper right of this slide. And there were about 55, 60 sets of remains in this mass grave. And the, the team separated the, the, the region, it was a it was a lot, you know, vacant lot. They separated the region into sectors and began exhuming remains. And so 
it, it was noticed quite soon that one set of remains was different than all the others and that it was clearly the set of remains of a child. So we were asked to see if we could sort this out on the basis of mitochondrial sequencing from the teeth. And so what we obtained was, as you see here, um, we obtained molars from all the sets of remains, like I said, about 55 of them, and from Karina and from Anna. And of all of those remains, the set number 49, which was the child, Kuwait child, matched Karina, as you would expect, since they would be mitochondrial DNA relatives if this was Carlitos. Uh, remains number 47 matched Karina also, which would make sense if that is her mother. And remains number 46 matched Anna, which would match, which would make sense if it's Carlos, her son. And again, all of these were, uh, you, you see the differences here, all of these were unique in the database that we had at the time. So the report of the forensic anthropology team recommended that these remains be returned to the family, and they were, and they were, they were buried properly. What about elsewhere? Right. So I was working on all of these, on all of these questions, and, and my, my friend, um, Noel Johnson, who had been working with the New York police, spread the word that we were able to do this. And I had a visit. Um, actually, I had a phone call. So here I am in Berkeley trying to, trying to clone BRCA1. Um, and I got a phone call from two officers of, of my army, the American army, who are based at the Central Identification Laboratory in Hawaii. And they said, we understand that you can identify remains using DNA sequencing. And I said, yes, we can. And, and they said, would you mind explaining it to us? And I, I said, well, let me sort of check, check you out first. So I, so I did so. And I called them back. And I said, I understand who you are. And I understand what you do. And they, they of course, had large numbers of sets of remains from US service personnel who'd gone missing in wars going way back. So I explained what we do. I explained everything I just told you. And uh, one, of, one of them finally stopped me. And he said, he said, ma'am, this may not be an original line, but this may be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> and it was. It, it was. The first case they asked me to work on was a case that those of you who are my generation and older will remember. Um, there was an American journalist named Wells Hangen who at the time of the uh, invasion of Cambodia by our army during the Vietnam War went missing along with three Cambodian colleagues. And he was, that was in 1970, and he was presumed dead, but it was, it was much later, 1992, when relations were good enough between the US and Cambodia and Vietnam that it was possible to do the, the exhumations as shown here. The, my now friends from the uh, US Army Central Identification Laboratory had remains, and they also gave me these pictures. And so we were able to identify um, Mr. Hangen's remains by matching his mitochondrial DNA sequence, in this case from his bones. They did not have good teeth from, from him. His skull was completely pulverized. But from his bones with his sister, and to return these remains to her. This led, as you might imagine, to many, many, many more requests to identify our MIAs from Southeast Asia, from Korea, from World War II. We worked in Guatemala. We were one of several groups that identified the Tsar and his family. Um, we also identified about 77 of the, uh, the uh, Balkan Muslims who were murdered near Srebrenica during the Balkans War in 1995. In this case, uh, there was no way, given the size of this massacre, that we could come close to identifying everyone. But uh, for those cases that we could identify, because we had mitochondrial relatives with which to match them, um, we provided the information to the International War Crimes Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and it was used in those identifications. Very dramatically, in Rwanda, um, this is the wall of skulls, we were able to do a few identifications there. Of course, you can't come close to identifying all of the remains, but the idea was to show, was to prove that the genocide happened as surviving witnesses had said it was happening. The most complex case we did was the case that 
that came out of the bombing of the Jewish Cultural Center in Buenos Aires by Hezbollah in 1994. And you'll remember that when that event occurred, um, 86 victims were identified by traditional forensic methods. The question posed to us by the forensic anthropology team was, were there more victims? It's a public building. The community people go in and out all the time. Were there victims that had not been identified? So the way we handled this was <laughs> we, were, we were given little bits of charcoalized material, kind of the size of your fingertip. And um, so on the one hand, we have from the forensic anthropology team uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of what I call trozos. It's just little charcoal bits. And on the other hand, we have uh, blood from the relatives of, of the 86 victims. And so we set it up as you would an experiment in ecology. If you want to know how many um, squirrels there are in Central Park in a particular region, you would wait in that region, you would capture a group of squirrels, you would tag them, you would send them back off into Central Park, you would go back three weeks later, you would capture another group of squirrels, and capture is probably the wrong word for squirrels in Central Park, but anyway, you would, you would encounter another group of squirrels, and you would say, to what extent does this second group overlap that first group? And if it overlaps it completely, you say, ah, then I can estimate from my original estimation, if I've, if I've tagged 10, 20 squirrels, and I know I've tagged one in 10 squirrels, then I know that that's, the origin, that that's the, about the population in this region of Central Park. But if, if only one squirrel overlaps, then who in any way has a tag from you, you say, oh, there's a lot more. And you can work out with a Poisson distribution what a lot more is likely to mean, how to make an estimate. So what we did, we attempted to, to extract DNA from all of these little bits of charcoal material that we had. We were only successful for 15 of them. Now I understand from Avram in, in a very similar situation, they have been successful with a much higher proportion, but this was 1992. So from 15 of these little, of these little fragments, we did identify DNA, enough of mitochondrial DNA to sequence. Then we went back to the, the maternal relatives of the 86 known victims, and every one of these 15 matched to one of those. So we sent that information to the forensic anthropology team, who said, you're probably right. You probably, we, we probably have found everyone. And indeed, nothing more has turned up. Uh, blessedly, it became possible to use an automated machine about that time, and we did. Uh, meanwhile, the last chapter, what is happening in Argentina with the grandmothers? And as Rosa said at about this same time, for decades we have been searching for our grandchildren. Someday they will come searching for us. And indeed that is what has happened. You remember Jose Sabina Abdala, who was kidnapped along with Maria Eugenia Katika. His mother was never found, but he was found. And he heard through one of one of these complex stories that I won't, won't go into, he heard that he might be a member of this kidnapped cohort. He presented himself to the Banco Nacional, the National Genetic Data Bank, and he was identified as Jose Sabina Adala in 1993. That's him. And my, my teacher, Rosa, we found her grandson also. So the Perez Rosenblit family lost Patricia and Jose Manuel. Maria, there uh, was was an infant at the time when Jose and Patricia were picked up by the militaries. Mariana was also, she was a baby, and she was returned to the Perez family, to Argentina Rojo. In, this was in 1978. In the year 2000, uh, Mariana had an anonymous phone call from a woman who said, that, that she thought she knew uh, where Mariana's brother was. And she wouldn't give any information. She just said, he is, his name is Guillermo Gomez, and he works at such and such a plant. So Mariana, a 
probably against her better against everybody's better judgment, but anyway, Mariana went to that plant and spoke to the manager and said, I'm looking for a man named Guillermo Gomez. And and the manager immediately said, oh, Guillermo, come here. There's a woman who wants to see you, Mariana. So she told him about this anonymous phone call. And he was, he, he tells me, I've gotten an call. well, he, he tells me that he was both skeptical and not skeptical. Um, he was very close to his, the, the woman he thought of as his mother. He loathed the person he thought of as his father, who was abusive to that man's wife and, and to Guillermo. Um, and he all and he didn't look anything like them. And he always wondered what was he, you know, who was he? So he said, let's find out who I am. So the grandmothers, because of just the happenstance of when this occurred, sent me um, DNA. They were now extracting DNA in the in the in the in the bank. They sent me DNA from Rosa, uh, from Mariana, and from this young man named Guillermo Gomez. So we sequence, and we get a perfect match of Guillermo to Rosa and to uh, Mariana, as you see here, with these uh, with the arrows indicating where all of these people, all three of these people, differ from the reference sequence, which is simply an arbitrary reference sequence. This turns out to be um, an Ashkenazi Jewish mitochondrial DNA sequence. Well, not surprisingly, there's more than one Ashkenazi Jewish family with missing people in this story, although only this one involves um, a, a, a kidnapped child who is known to be male and known to be born at, at the critical time. But nonetheless, I said, we need more. And by now, we are at 2000. This is modern times. So the technology of 2000 enabled us to, to select mitochondrial, I'm sorry, microsatellite markers that are nuclear, that have multiple alleles each, representing 10 different chromosomes, to genotype all of those in, in Rosa, in Argentino Rojo, the other undisputed grandmother of Mariana, in Mariana herself, and in Guillermo, and to ask the question, based on the allele frequencies of these markers, just setting aside what we know about this family, how many alleles would we expect uh, Guillermo, if he were unrelated to the family, to share? And the answer for this particular set of markers was we would expect four. We did that both by a simulation and by, by direct, um, direct statistical analysis. And it turns out that they share 14, that he shares 14 alleles out of 20, two times 10, with Mariana. So that, combined with the mitochondrial sequence, was very, very, very strong evidence that this is who he is. The um, imposed father became very threatening, both to his wife and to Guillermo. He was ultimately taken to court. I mean, it was very, I mean, they were all lucky to have escaped with their lives. Um, and he was, he's now in, he's still in prison. Um, and this is Guillermo and Mariana and Rosa. This is several years ago. She is now 104 years old, still alive. Um, and I saw her a year ago when she was only 103, and we, we had a fabulous conversation. Um, so 133 grandchildren have now been found. The approach has become known as genetic genealogy. It's proven quite useful worldwide. Now, of course, we can add to our technologies long read sequencing. And I'd like to end with a poem from Ariel Dorfman, which he wrote for us. And finally, when the day comes, when they ask you to identify the body, and you see me, and a voice says, we killed him, the poor bastard died, he's dead. When they tell you that I am absolutely, completely, definitively dead, don't believe them, don't believe them, don't believe them. Thanks. I wish to thank uh, Professor King for a very, I don't know, very moving and informative talk. And I think it's about the time to thank so you also I, formally. I measured up. You measured up. <laughs> yes, we decided it was quite interesting. So I think we will give her the medal. Is that OK with the audience? <laughs> And this is this is Albert. This is the Albert, this is the famous Albert. Albert Einstein Memorial Medal yeah. given to.
the people who deliver the annual Albert Einstein. That he probably shared the same mitochondrial DNA as, uh, Rosa. as Rosa. Yeah. Rosenblatt. I, I would be prepared to guess. I don't know, but I'd guess. So thank you again. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again for coming. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful, unusual lecture. Thank you, audience. Thank you, viewers. Lailatov.